Book Two, Chapter Twenty One of the Mystical City of God, Volume Two, by the Venerable Sister Mary of Jesus of Agreda. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Chapter Twenty One The Lord Prepares the Most Holy Mary for the Flight into Egypt. The Angel Speaks to Saint Joseph and Other Matters Connected Therewith. When the most holy Mary and glorious Saint Joseph returned from the presentation of the infant Jesus in the temple, they concluded to stay in Jerusalem for nine days in order to be able each day to visit the temple and repeat the offering of the sacred victim, their divine son, thus rendering fitting thanks for the immense blessing for which they had been singled out from among all men. The heavenly lady had a special veneration for this number in memory of the nine days, during which she had been prepared and adorned by God for the incarnation of the word, as I have related in the first ten chapters of this second part, also in memory of the nine months, during which she had borne Jesus in her virginal womb. In honor of these events, she wished to make this novena with her divine child, presenting him that many times to the Eternal Father, as an acceptable offering for her lofty purposes. They began the devotions of the novena every day before the third hour, praying in the temple until nightfall. They chose the most obscure and retired place, meriting thereby the invitation of the master of the banquet and the gospel. Friend, go up higher. Luke chapter 14 verse 10. This invitation was given to her on one of those days when she was pouring out her spirit in the presence of the Eternal Father in the following words. Highest King, Lord and Creator of all that has being, here in thy presence lies the useless dust and ashes which thy ineffable condescension has favored with grace, such as it never knew nor ever could know how to merit. I find myself, O Lord, forced onward by the impetuous flood of thy blessings, to give thee thanks. But what return can she offer, who, being nothing, has received her existence and her life from thee, and who over and above was overwhelmed by such incomparable mercies and blessings of thy divinity? What thanks can she render in acknowledgment of thy immense bounty? What reverence worthy of thy majesty? what gift to thy infinite deity since she is only a creature my soul my being and my faculties all i have received and continue to receive from thy hands a thousand times do i offer it in sacrifice to thy glory i acknowledge my indebtedness not only for having given me all this but for the love with which thou hast given it and because among all creatures thy infinite bounty has preserved me from the contagion of sin, and has chosen me to give human form to thy only begotten Son, to bear him in my womb and at my breast, though I am only a daughter of Adam, and made of lowly and earthly matter. I perceive thy ineffable condescension toward me, O Lord, and in gratitude for it my heart fails, and my life is spent in affections of divine love, having nothing else to repay all the favors of thy right hand, conferred upon thy handmaid. But now my heart is revived and rejoices in possessing a gift worthy of thy greatness, since I can offer thee him, who is one in substance with thee, equal in majesty and perfect of attributes, the only begotten of thy intellect, the image of thy being, the fullness of thy own pleasure, thy only and most beloved Son. This, eternal Father and most high God, is the gift, which I offer, the victim which I bring thee, and this I am sure thou wilt receive. Having received him as God, I return him to thee, God and man. Neither I nor any other creature, O Lord, can ever offer thee a greater gift, nor can thy majesty ever demand one more precious. It is so valuable, that it will suffice to repay thee for what I have received. In his name and in mine, I offer and present him to thee, I am the mother of thy only begotten, having given him human flesh. I have made him the brother of mortals, and as he wishes to be their redeemer and teacher, it behooves me to be their advocate, to assume their cause and claim assistance for them. Therefore, father of my only begotten, God of mercies, I offer him to thee from all my heart. With him and because of him, I beg thee to pardon sinners, to pour out upon the human race thy mercies of old, and to open new fountains for the renewal of thy wonders. 
Ecclesiasticus, chapter 38, verse 6. This is the lion of Judah become a lamb, which takes away the sins of the world. Apocalypse, chapter 5, verse 5. He is the treasure of thy divinity. Such prayers and petitions the mother of piety offered up in the first days of her novena in the temple. To all of them, the eternal father responded, accepting the offer of his only begotten as a pleasing sacrifice, being more and more enamored with the purity of his only and chosen daughter, and looking upon her sanctity with benign pleasure. As an answer to her petitions, he conceded to her new and great privileges, among which was also this one, that as long as the world should last, she should obtain all that she would ever ask for her clients, that the greatest sinners, if they availed themselves of her intercession, should find salvation, that in the new church and law of the gospel, she should be the co-operatrix and teacher of salvation with Christ, her most holy son. This was to be her privilege, especially after his ascension into heaven, when she should remain as queen of the universe, as the representative and instrument of the divine power on earth. This I will show more particularly in the third part of this history. Many other favors and mysteries the Most High conferred upon the Heavenly Mother in answer to her prayers. They, however, are beyond the reach of spoken language and cannot be described by my short and limited terms. In the course of these manifestations, on the fifth day of the Novena, after the presentation and purification, while the heavenly lady was in the temple with the infant on her arms, the deity revealed itself to her, although not intuitively, and she was wholly raised and filled by the Spirit. It is true that this had been done to her before, but as God's power and treasures are infinite, he never gives so much as not to be able to give still more to the creatures. In this abstractive vision, the Most High visited anew his only spouse, wishing to prepare her for the labors that were awaiting her. Speaking to her, he comforted her, saying, My spouse and my dove, thy wishes and intentions are pleasing to my eyes, and I delight in them always. But thou canst not finish the nine days' devotion which thou hast begun. For I have in store for thee other exercises of thy love. In order to save the life of thy son and raise him up, thou must leave thy home and thy country, fly with him and thy spouse Joseph into Egypt, where thou art to remain until I shall ordain otherwise, for Herod is seeking the life of the child. The journey is long, most laborious, and most fatiguing. Do thou suffer it all for my sake, for I am, and always will be, with thee. Any other faith and virtue might have been disturbed, as the incredulous really have been, to see the powerful God flying from a miserable earthly being, and that he should do so in order to save his life, as if he, being both God and man, should be affected by the fear of death. But the most prudent and obedient mother advanced no objection or doubt. She was not in the least disturbed or moved by this unlooked-for order. Answering, she said, My Lord and Master, Behold thy servant with a heart, prepared to die for thy love if necessary. Dispose of me according to thy will. This only I do ask of thy immense goodness, that overlooking my want of merit and gratitude, thou permit not my son and lord to suffer, and that thou turn all pains and labor upon me, who am obliged to suffer them. The Lord referred her to St. Joseph, bidding her to follow his directions in all things concerning the journey. Therewith she issued from her vision, which she had enjoyed without losing the use of her exterior senses, and while holding in her arms the infant Jesus. She had been raised up in this vision, only as to the superior part of her soul, but from it flowed other gifts, which spiritualized her senses, and testified to her that her soul was living more in its love than in the earthly habitation of her body. On account of the incomparable love, which the queen bore toward her most holy son, her maternal and compassionate heart was somewhat harrowed at the thought of the labors, which she foresaw in the vision impending upon the infant God. Shedding many tears, she left the temple to go to her lodging place, without manifesting to her spouse the cause of her sorrow. St. Joseph thought therefore that she grieved on account of the prophecy of Simeon. As the most faithful Joseph loved her so much, 
and as he was of a kind and solicitous disposition, he was troubled to see his spouse so tearful and afflicted, and that she should not manifest to him the cause of this new affliction. This disturbance of his soul was one of the reasons why the holy angel spoke to him in sleep, as I have related above, when speaking of the pregnancy of the queen. For in the same night, while St. Joseph was asleep, the angel of the Lord appeared to him, and spoke to him as recorded by St. Matthew. Arise, take the child and its mother, and fly into Egypt. There shalt thou remain, until I shall return to give thee other advice. For Herod is seeking after the child, in order to take away its life. Immediately the holy spouse arose, full of solicitude and sorrow, foreseeing also that of his most loving spouse. Entering upon her retirement, he said, my lady god wills that we should be afflicted for his holy angel has announced to me the pleasure and the decree of the almighty that we arise and fly with the child into egypt because herod is seeking to take away its life encourage thyself my lady to bear the labors of this journey and tell me what i can do for thy comfort since i hold my life and being at the service of thy child and of thee my husband and my master answered the queen if we have received from the hands of the Most High such great blessings of grace, it is meet that we joyfully accept temporal afflictions. Job chapter 2 verse 13 We bear with us the Creator of heaven and earth. If he has placed us so near to him, what arm shall be able to harm us, even if it be the arm of Herod? Wherever we carry with us all our good, the highest treasure of heaven, our Lord, our guide and true light, there can be no desert but he is our rest our portion and our country all these goods we possess in having his company let us proceed to fulfill his will then most holy mary and joseph approached the crib where the infant jesus lay and where he not by chance slept at that time the heavenly mother uncovered him without awakening him for he awaited those tender and sorrowful words of his beloved fly away o my beloved and be like the roe and the young heart, upon the mountains of aromatical spices. Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field, let us ride in the villages. Canticles chapter 8 verse 14 and chapter 7 verse 11 And the tender mother added, Sweetest love, meekest lamb, thy power is not limited by that of earthly kings, but thou wishest in thy exalted vision to hide it for love of men, who among mortals can think of taking away thy life, O my God? Is it not in thy power to annihilate all life? Since thou givest life to all, why should men take away thine? John chapter 10 verse 10 Since thou visited them in order to give them eternal life, why should they wish to give thee death? But who shall comprehend the secrets of thy providence? Romans chapter 11 verse 34 Allow me then, O Lord, and light of my soul, to awaken thee, for when thou sleepest, thy heart is awake. Some such sentiments were also expressed by St. Joseph. Then the heavenly mother, falling upon her knees, awakened the sweetest infant, and took him in her arms. Jesus, in order to move her to greater tenderness, and in order to show himself as true man, wept a little. O wonders of the Most High, in things according to our judgment so small! yet he was soon again quieted, and when the Most Holy Mother and St. Joseph asked his blessing, he gave it them in visible manner. Gathering their poor clothing into the casket, and loading it on the beast of burden which they had brought from Nazareth, they departed shortly after midnight, and hastening without delay on their journey to Egypt, as I will relate in the following chapter. I will add here what I have been made to understand as to the concordance of the two Gospels of St. Matthew and St. Luke in regard to this event. For since all of them wrote under guidance and light of the Holy Ghost, each of them knew what the other three had written, and what they had omitted to say in their Gospels. Hence it happened that according to the divine predisposition, some of the happenings of the life of Christ and of the Gospel were described by all four of the evangelists, while again, some other things mentioned by one were omitted by the others. St. Matthew describes the adoration of the kings and the flight into Egypt, while these events were not mentioned by St. Luke. 
he again describes the circumcision, presentation, and purification, which are omitted by St. Matthew. Thus St. Matthew, after referring to the departure of the Magi, immediately, without speaking of the presentation, relates that the angel appeared to St. Joseph, commanding him to fly into Egypt, but it does not follow therefrom that the child had not been presented before that time in the temple, for it is certain that this was done after the departure of the kings and before the flight into Egypt, as is narrated by St. Luke. Thus likewise, although St. Luke, after describing the presentation and purification, immediately mentions that the Holy Family lived in Nazareth, we must not conclude that they had not before that time lived in Egypt, he writes nothing of this flight into Egypt, either before or after, because it had already been recorded by St. Matthew. And this flight took place immediately after the presentation, before Most Holy Mary and Joseph returned to Nazareth. As St. Luke had received no commission to write about this journey, it was natural that, in continuing his history, he should mention the return to Nazareth immediately after the presentation. To say that, having fulfilled what the law commanded, they returned to Galilee, was not to deny the flight into Egypt, but it was merely continuing the narrative without mentioning the flight from Herod. Even the very text of St. Luke intimates that the return to Nazareth happened after their sojourn into Egypt, for he says that the child grew and increased in wisdom, and that grace was manifested in him, which could not have been before he had passed the years of infancy. Hence it must have been after his return from Egypt, and at an age when the use of reason usually begins to show itself in children. I was also given to understand how foolish it is in the infidels or incredulous to stumble against this cornerstone of Christ, even in his infancy, and to take offense at seeing him fly into Egypt in order to defend himself against Herod, as if this were on account of his weakness and not a mystery, and as if it had happened for no higher purpose than to defend his life against the cruelty of a wicked man. For the well-disposed souls, the words of the evangelists are amply sufficient, since he says it happened in order for the prophecy of Osea might be fulfilled, who prophesies in the name of the Eternal Father. And I called my son out of Egypt. Osea chapter 11 verse 1 the ends which he had in view in sending him there, and in calling him thence, are most exalted and mysterious. Of these I will say something anon. If not all of the doings of the incarnate word are equally admirable and sacramental, yet no one with sane judgment can dispute or ignore the sweet providence of God in directing the secondary causes, while following full liberty of the human will. Ecclesiasticus chapter 15 verse 14 for this reason, and not for want of power, he permits so many idolatries, heresies, and other sins, which are not any smaller than that of Herod. For this reason, he permitted the crime of Judas, and all those which followed in the sufferings and crucifixion of Christ. Certainly he could have prevented all these sins, and yet would not, not only because he wished to work our redemption, but also in order that he might secure to man freedom of his will in all his actions, he was ready to give to men the helps and graces according to his divine providence, whereby they could accomplish the good, if they would only use their free will to attain it, in the same degree as they were using it to follow evil. In this sweetness of his providence, he gives sinners time, hoping for their conversions, as in the case of Herod, if he would use his absolute power and perform great miracles for preventing the course of secondary causes, the order of nature would be confounded, and to a certain extent, he would contradict himself in his double role as author of grace and as author of nature. Therefore, miracles must happen but rarely, and on special occasions, for particular reasons, or when some end is to be served. Therefore God reserves them for the manifestations of his power at certain times. He makes himself known as the author of his works, by bringing them into existence, and preserving them independently of creatures. Neither must we wonder that he should consent to the death of the innocent children, which Herod murdered, for it would not have been to their benefit to save them through a miracle, since by their death they were to gain eternal life, together with an abundant reward, which vastly recompensed them for the loss of their temporal life. 
if they had been allowed to escape the sword and die a natural death all would eventually not have been saved the works of the lord are just and holy in all particulars although we do not always see the reasons why they are so but we shall come to know them in the lord when we shall see him face to face instruction which the queen of heaven most holy mary gave me my daughter what thou must especially learn from this chapter is that thou accustom thyself to humble thanksgiving for the benefits which thou receivest since thou among many generations art so specially signalized by the riches of grace with which my son and i visit thee without any merit of thine i was wont to repeat many times this verse of david what shall i render to the lord for all the things which he hath rendered to me psalm 115 verse 12 in such sentiments i humiliated myself to the dust esteeming myself altogether useless among creatures therefore if thou knowest what i did as mother of god consider what then is thy obligation since thou must with so much truth confess thyself unworthy and undeserving of all thou receivest and so poorly furnished for giving thanks and for making payment thou must supply thy insufficiency and thy misery by offering up to the eternal father the living host of his only begotten son especially when thou receivest him in the holy sacrament and possesses him within thee for in this thou shouldest also imitate david who after asking the lord what return he should make for all his benefits answers i will take the chalice of salvation and i will call upon the name of the lord psalm 115 verse 13 thou must accept the salvation offered to thee and bring forth its fruits by the perfection of thy works calling upon the name of the lord offering up his only begotten for he it is who gave the virtue of salvation who merited it who alone can be an adequate return for the blessings conferred upon the human race and upon thee especially i have given him human form in order that he might converse with men and become the property of each one he conceals himself under the appearances of bread and wine in order to accommodate himself to the needs of each one and that each one might consider him as his personal property fit to offer to the eternal father in this way he furnishes to each one an oblation which no one could offer otherwise and the most high rest satisfied with it since there is not anything more acceptable nor anything more precious in the possession of creatures in addition to this offering is the resignation with which souls embrace and bear with equanimity and patience the labors and difficulties of mortal life my most holy son and i were eminent masters in the practice of this doctrine my son began to teach it from the moment in which he was conceived in my womb for already then he began to suffer and as soon as he was born into the world he and i were banished by herod into a desert and his sufferings continued until he died on the cross i also labored to the end of my life as thou wilt be informed more and more in the writing of this history since therefore we suffered so much for creatures and for their salvation i desire thee to imitate us in this conformity to the divine will as being his spouse and my daughter suffer with a magnanimous heart and labor to increase the possessions of thy lord and master namely souls which are so precious in his sight and which he has purchased with his life blood never shouldest thou fly from labors difficulties bitterness and sorrows if by any of them thou canst gain a soul for the lord or if thou canst thereby induce it to leave the path of sin and enter the path of life let not the thought that thou art so useless and poor or that thy desires and labor avail but little discourage thee since thou canst not know how the lord will accept of them and in how far he shall consider himself served thereby at least thou shouldest wish to labor assiduously and eat no unearned bread in his house Proverbs chapter 31 verse 27 End of chapter 21book two chapter twenty two of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter twenty two 
Jesus, Mary, and Joseph begin the journey to Egypt. Accompanied by the angelic spirits, they arrive at the city of Gaza. Our heavenly pilgrims left Jerusalem and entered upon their banishment, while yet the silence and obscurity of night held sway. They were full of solicitude for the pledge of heaven, which they carried with them into a strange and unknown land. Although faith and hope strengthened them, for in no other beings could these virtues be more firmly and securely established than in our queen and her most faithful spouse. Nevertheless, the Lord afforded them occasion for anxiety. Their love for the infant Jesus would naturally excite in them anxiety and suffering on an occasion like this. They knew not what would happen during such a long journey, nor when it should end, nor how they would fare in Egypt, where they would be entire strangers, nor what comfort or convenience they would find there for raising the child, nor even how they would be able to ward off great sufferings from him on the way to Egypt. Therefore the hearts of these holy parents were filled with many misgivings and anxious thoughts when they parted with so much haste from their lodging place, but their sorrow was much relieved when the ten thousand heavenly courtiers above mentioned again appeared to them in human forms and in their former splendor and beauty, and when they again changed the night into the brightest day for the holy pilgrims. As they set forth from the portals of the city, the holy angels humiliated themselves and adored the incarnate word in the arms of the virgin mother. They also encouraged her by again offering their homage and service, stating that it was the will of the Lord that they guide and accompany her on the journey. To the afflicted heart, the least consolation seems precious, hence this one, being in itself a great relief, comforted our queen and her spouse Joseph very much. They therefore entered upon their journey with good heart, choosing the way which led through the city gate in the direction of Nazareth. The heavenly mother longed to visit again the place of the nativity, in order to venerate the sacred cave and the crib, which had offered shelter and hospitality to her most holy son at his entrance into the world. But the holy angels, knowing of her unspoken desires, said to her, Our queen and lady, mother of our creator, it behooves us to hasten on our journey without delay, for on account of the escape of the Magi kings, and their failure to return to Jerusalem, and on account of the words spoken by the priest Simeon and by Anne, the people have been aroused to attention. Some of them have begun to say that thou art the mother of the Messias, others that thou knowest of him, and others say that thy son is a prophet. Various rumors are also spread about concerning the visit of the kings in Bethlehem, and of all these things Herod is informed. He has commanded that you be sought after very carefully, and consequently a most diligent search is made to find you. On this account the Most High has commanded you to fly at night and with so much haste. The Queen of Heaven yielded to the will of the Almighty, thus made known to her by the holy angels. She therefore reverenced from afar the sacred place of the birth of her only begotten, renewing the memory of the mysteries there wrought and the favors there received. The holy angel who stood guard at the sacred cave approached them on their way in visible form and adored the incarnate word in the arms of his mother. As she was thus allowed to see this angel and speak to him, the heavenly lady was rejoiced and comforted still more. She would have also preferred to travel by way of Hebron, since it was only a short distance from the one they were now traveling, and Elizabeth was just at that time in that city with her son John. But the anxiety of St. Joseph, who was more timid, prevented also this diversion and delay, for he said to his heavenly spouse, My lady, I think it is extremely important that we do not delay our journey even for one instant, and that we hasten as much as possible to flee from the place of danger. Therefore it will not be prudent to go to Hebron, where they will find us more easily than in other parts of the country. Let it be according to thy pleasure answered the humble queen. Yet I wish thou give me permission to send one of these celestial spirits to Elizabeth in order to inform my cousin of the cause of our flight, so that she herself may protect her son, for the wrath of Herod is so roused that it will extend to them. The queen of heaven knew of the design to murder the children, but she did not tell St. Joseph of it at that time. Here I must marvel at the obedience and humility of Most Holy Mary, which was so exquisite and rare. 
for she obeyed St. Joseph, not only in that which he commanded, but also in that which concerned herself alone, namely, in the matter of sending an angel to St. Elizabeth. Although she could have sent the angel by a mere wish, without even expressing it in words, she nevertheless preferred not to do so without permission and in obedience to her spouse. I must confess my shame and my negligence, since having before my eyes the most pure fountain of waters, I do not satiate my thirst, nor profit by the light and the example before me, though it is so vivid, so sweet, so powerful, and so attractive, in teaching us all to abjure our own reprehensible wills. With the permission of St. Joseph, then Most Holy Mary dispatched one of the principal angels of her guard, in order to notify St. Elizabeth of what was passing. As the sovereign of the angelic spirits, she instructed her messenger on this occasion what he was to say to the holy matron and to the child John. The angel, according to the order and pleasure of the queen, proceeded to inform the fortunate and blessed Elizabeth of all these events as far as was proper. He told her that the mother of God was fleeing before the wrath of Herod into Egypt, as this tyrant was now searching for the child in order to kill it. He warned her to see to the safety of St. John by hiding him in some place of refuge. He also manifested to her other mysteries of the incarnate word, according to the command of the heavenly mother. The holy Elizabeth was filled with joy and wonder at this message, and she expressed her desire to meet and adore the infant Jesus and to see his mother, asking him whether they could be reached. The holy angel answered that his king and lord was passing with his mother at a distance from Hebron and could not wait for her visit. Saint Elizabeth therefore gave up her project. Overflowing with tender and tearful affection, she asked the angel to bring affectionate greetings to the mother and son. The angel then returned with his message to the queen. Saint Elizabeth immediately dispatched a servant with some gifts consisting in provisions, money and material for clothing the infant. She foresaw their needs in a strange country and instructed the servant to overtake them with all haste. He met them in Gaza, which lies a little less than twenty hours from Jerusalem, on the river Bezor, and on the road from Palestine to Egypt, not far from the Mediterranean Sea. In this town they remained two days, for St. Joseph and the beast of burden, which carried the queen, were worn out by the fatigue of the journey. From that place they sent back the servant of St. Elizabeth, taking care to caution him not to tell any one of their whereabouts. But God provided still more effectually against this danger, for he took away from this man all remembrance of what St. Joseph had charged him to conceal, so that he retained only his message to St. Elizabeth. Most Holy Mary expended the gifts sent by Elizabeth in entertaining the poor, for she, who was mother of the poor, could not bear to pass them by unassisted. Of the clothes sent to her, she made a cloak for the divine infant, and one for St. Joseph, to shelter them from the discomforts of the season and of the journey. She also used other things in their possession, for the comfort of her child and of St. Joseph. The most prudent virgin would not rely on miraculous assistance, whenever she could provide for the daily needs, by her own diligence and labor. For in these matters, she desired to subject herself to the natural order, and depend upon her own efforts. During the two days which they spent in that city, the most pure Mary, in order to enrich it with great blessings, performed some wonderful deeds. She freed two sick persons from the danger of death and cured other ailments. She restored to another person, a crippled woman, the use of her limbs. In the souls of many who met her and conversed with her, she caused divine effects of the knowledge of God and of a change of life. All of them felt themselves moved to praise their creator. But neither Mary nor Joseph spoke a word about their native country, nor of the destination or object of their journey. For if this information had been added to the public notice, caused by their wonderful actions, the attention of Herod's agents might have been drawn toward them, and they might have found sufficient inducement to follow them after their departure. Words fail me to describe what I have been made to understand, concerning the happenings during this journey of Jesus and Mary. Moreover, I fall short of the sentiments of reverence and piety which such admirable mysteries would require. The arms of the most pure Mary continually served as a delightful couch for the new and real King Solomon. Canticles chapter 3 verse 7 
as she penetrated in spirit into the secret of the most holy humanity of christ it happened sometimes that the son and mother interchanged sweet colloquies and canticles of praise in honor especially of the infinite essence of god and of all his attributes and perfections on these occasions the son of god favored his sovereign mother with new visions of intellectual clearness in which he perceived the unity of essence in the three persons of god the operations ad intra in the generation of the word and in the procession of the holy spirit she perceived how the three are from eternity and how the word is generated by the operation of the eternal intellect and the holy ghost is breathed forth in the operation of the will how there is no need of any succession of before or after but how all is from eternity and how it happens that we conceive these operations with the idea of duration or succession of time she also perceived how these three persons comprehend each other by one and the same act of understanding and how this comprehension includes the divinity of the incarnate word united to the humanity forming one person and what effects this union produces in the humanity filled with this exalted knowledge the great lady allowed her thoughts to descend from the divinity to the humanity and compose new canticles of praise and thanksgiving for the creation of this sacred humanity most perfect in soul and body the soul in its plenitude and all possible abundance of wisdom gifts and graces of the holy ghost the body most pure and in the highest possible degree well composed and complexioned then again she contemplated the exalted and heroic activity of all his faculties and having in her soul imitated him therein she passed on to bless and give him thanks for having made her his mother caused her to be conceived without sin chosen her out of thousands enriched her with all the favors and gifts of his powerful right hand as far as was possible in a mere creature in the exaltation and glory of these and other mysteries the child spoke to his mother and she responded in words which are beyond the tongue of angels and beyond the conception of any other created being to all this the heavenly lady attended without neglecting the care and comfort of her child giving him nourishment at her breast three times a day tenderly caressing him as a mother more attentive and loving than all other mothers combined could be toward their children at other times she said to him my sweetest and most beloved son permit me to speak to thee and to manifest to thee my desires although thou my lord already knowest them permit me to be delighted in the sound of thy voice tell me life of my soul and light of my eyes whether the labors of this journey are fatiguing thee whether the rigors of the season and of the weather cause thee affliction and what i can do for thy service and for thy relief and the divine infant answered all the labors o mother and all fatigue are most light and sweet to me since i undergo them for the honor of my eternal father and for the instruction and redemption of men especially in thy company the child wept a few times yet in great serenity and in the manner of a grown-up and perfect man and immediately the loving mother sought the interior cause of these tears finding it in his soul she understood that they were tears of love and compassion for the salvation of men and caused by their ingratitude in this sorrow and weeping the sweetest mother imitated him she was wont to answer his tearful plaints like a compassionate turtle dove lovingly caressing and soothing him as his affectionate mother and kissing him with matchless reverence the fortunate joseph often witnessed these divine mysteries and shared in some of the enlightenments thus consoling him for the hardships of the journey at other times he would converse with his spouse as they journeyed along asking her frequently whether she desired any service for herself or for the child or he would approach and adore the infant kissing his feet and asking his blessing and sometimes taking him in his arms by these little offices of kindness the great patriarch sweetened his labors being at the same time consoled and encouraged by his heavenly spouse all these things she attended with a magnanimous heart being hindered neither by her interior prayer nor by her exalted and fervent contemplation from attending to the corporal affairs for in all things she was most perfect instruction given by my heavenly mother and mistress my dearest daughter for thy instruction and imitation i wish 
in what thou hast written that thou take as an example the affectionate wonder which the divine light caused in my soul at seeing my most holy son subject himself to the inhuman fury of wicked men such as was shown by herod in this occasion of our flight from his wrath and afterwards by the perverse servants of the high priests and magistrates in all the works of the most high his greatness goodness and infinite wisdom shine forth but since my understanding by means of the most exalted inspiration penetrated so deeply into the very essence of god in the person of the word united to the divinity and since i knew that my most holy son was the eternal all-powerful infinite creator and preserver of all things and that this iniquitous king depended for his life and existence entirely upon this very beneficence i was particularly struck with wonder to see the most sacred humanity pray and beseech his eternal father to confer upon herod at this very time enlightenment help and blessing to see my son who had it so much in his power to punish him by his prayers prevent the full measure of chastisement which he deserved although herod's purpose was frustrated yet this obstinate reprobate was visited with less chastisement than would have been given to him if my holy son had not prayed for him all this and whatever else is contained in this matchless mercy and kindness of jesus i sought to imitate for as a teacher he taught me thus early what he afterwards inculcated by his actions words and example concerning the love of enemies matthew chapter five verse forty four when i perceive how he concealed and disguised his infinite power and how being the invincible lion he became a meek and humble lamb isaiah chapter five verse twenty nine amidst the fury of ravenous wolves my heart was overwhelmed and my faculties failed me in the ardent desire of loving him imitating and following him in his love charity patience and meekness this example i place before thee for thy constant imitation so that thou mayest understand to what extremes thou must be willing to bear and suffer forgive and love all who offend thee for neither thou nor other creatures are innocent and without fault and many are burdened with numerous and oft-repeated sins by which they have merited all offences and insults now if persecutions afford thee the advantage of imitating him why shouldest thou not esteem them as a great blessing why shouldest thou not love those who give thee occasion to practise this highest perfection why not thank them for this benefit and hold them not as enemies but as benefactors who afford thee a chance to obtain what is of so much importance for thy welfare on account of the object lesson contained in this history thou wilt not be without guilt if thou fall short in this matter for the divine light and all that thou perceivest and understandest through it is as it were before thy eyes as in a living example End of chapter twenty two book two chapter twenty three of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter twenty three jesus mary and joseph pursue their journey from the city of gaza to heliopolis in egypt on the third day after our pilgrims had touched gaza they departed from that city for egypt soon after leaving the inhabited parts of palestine they entered the sandy deserts of bersabe which they were obliged to traverse for sixty leagues in order to arrive and take their abode in heliopolis the present cairo in egypt this journey through the desert consumed a number of days for the distance they could travel each day was but short not only on account of the laborious progress over the deep sand but also on account of the hardships occasioned by the want of shelter there were many incidents on their way through this solitude i will mention some of them from which others can be conjectured for it is not necessary to relate all of them in order to understand how much mary and joseph and also infant jesus suffered on their pilgrimage it must be remembered that the almighty permitted his only begotten with his most holy mother and saint joseph to suffer the inconveniences and hardships naturally connected with travel through this desert 
and although the heavenly lady made no complaints yet she was much afflicted which was also true of her most faithful husband for both of them suffered many personal inconveniences and discomforts while the mother in addition thereto was afflicted still more on account of the sufferings of her son and of saint joseph and the latter was deeply grieved not to be able by his diligence and care to ease the hardships of the child and his spouse during this journey of sixty leagues through the desert they had no other night shelter than the sky and open air moreover it was in the time of winter for this journey took place in the month of february only six days after the purification as was indicated in the last chapter in the first night on these sandy plains they rested at the foot of a small hill this being the only protection they could find the queen of heaven with the child in her arms seated herself on the ground and with her husband she ate of the victuals brought with them from gaza the empress of heaven also nursed the infant jesus at her breast and he on his part rejoiced his mother and her husband by his contentment in order to furnish them with some kind of shelter against the open air however narrow and humble it might be saint joseph formed a sort of tent for the divine word and most holy mary by means of his cloak and some sticks during that night the ten thousand angels who full of marvel assisted these heavenly pilgrims in visible human shapes formed a guard around their king and queen the great lady perceived that her divine son offered up to the eternal father the hardships and labors both of himself and of mary and joseph in these prayers and in the other acts of his deified soul the queen joined him for the greater part of the night the divine infant slept for a short time in her arms while she continued wakeful and engaged in heavenly colloquies with the most high and his angels saint joseph slept upon the ground resting his head upon the chest which contained the clothing and other articles of their baggage on the next day they pursued their journey and their little store of fruit and bread was soon exhausted so that they began to suffer great want and to feel the hunger although joseph was more deeply concerned yet both of them felt this privation very much on one of the first days of their journey they partook of no sustenance until nine o'clock at night not having any more even of the coarse and poor food which until then had sustained them in their hardships and labor as nature demanded some refreshment after the exertion and weariness of travel and as there was no way of supplying their want by natural means the heavenly lady addressed herself to the most high in these words eternal great and powerful god i give thee thanks and bless thee for thy magnificent bounty and also that without my merits only on account of thy merciful condescension thou gavest me life and being and preservest me in it though i am but dust and a useless creature i have not made a proper return for all these benefits therefore how can i ask for myself what i cannot repay but my lord and father look upon thy only begotten and grant me what is necessary to sustain my natural life and also that of my spouse so that i may serve thy majesty and thy word made flesh for the salvation of men in order that the clamors of the sweet mother might proceed from yet greater tribulation the most high permitted the elements to afflict them more than at other times and in addition to the sufferings caused by their fatigue destitution and hunger for there arose a storm of wind and rain which harassed and blinded them by its fury this hardship grieved still more the tender-hearted and loving mother on account of the delicate child which was not yet fifty days old although she tried to cover and protect him as much as possible yet she could not prevent him from feeling the inclemency of the weather so that he shed tears and shivered from the cold in the same manner as other children are wont to do then the anxious mother making use of her power as queen and mistress of creatures commanded the elements not to afflict their creator but to afford him shelter and refreshment and wreak their vengeance upon her alone and as related once before on the occasion of the birth of christ and on the journey to jerusalem again the wind immediately moderated and the storm abated not daring to approach the mother and child in return for this loving forethought the infant jesus commanded his angels to assist his kindest mother and to serve her as a shield against the inclemency of the weather they immediately complied and constructed a resplendent and beautiful globe round about and over their incarnate god his mother and her spouse 
in this they were protected and defended more effectually than all the wealthy and powerful of the world in their palaces and rich garments the same they did several times during the journey through the desert nevertheless they were in want of food and they were destitute of other things unprovidable by their own mere human effort but the lord allowed them to fall into this need in order that listening to the acceptable prayers of his spouse he might make provision also for this by the hands of the angels they brought them delicious bread and well-seasoned fruits and moreover a most delicious drink all of which they administered and served with their hands then all of them together sang hymns of praise and thanksgiving to the lord who gives food to all creatures at opportune times in order that the poor may eat and be filled psalm 135 verse 25 whose eyes and hopes are fixed upon his kingly providence and bounty of such a kind was the delicate feast with which the lord regaled his three exiled wanderers in the desert of bersabe third book of kings chapter nineteen verse three for it was the same desert in which elias fleeing from jezebel was comforted by the hearth cake brought to him by the angel in order that he might travel to horeb mount yet neither this bread nor the bread and meat which once before the ravens had miraculously brought him every morning and evening at the torrent of kareth nor the manna which fell from heaven for the israelites although it was called the bread of angels and dropped from heaven nor the quails which were carried to them by the african winds nor the cloud tent which overshadowed them none of all these could be compared to the succor and relief which the lord afforded to his only begotten and to his mother and saint joseph for these favors were not to be conferred upon a prophet or upon an ungrateful and unthinking people but they were intended for the nourishment and protection of a god incarnate for his true mother they were intended for the preservation of the natural life of christ on which depended the eternal life of the whole human race but if this food was worthy of the excellence of those who were invited so was also the thanksgiving and gratitude worthy of the blessings conferred in order that all this might be so much the more opportune the lord permitted the necessity to become extreme and thus naturally called into play the assistance of heaven let the poor rejoice in this example let the hungry confide let the destitute take new courage let none complain of divine providence no matter how afflicted and needy they may find themselves to be when has the lord ever failed him who hoped in his assistance psalm seventeen verse thirty one when has he ever turned away his countenance from his afflicted and needy children we are brothers of his only son incarnate children and heirs of his blessings and also children of his kindest mother why then ye children of god and of this most holy mother do you continue to distress such parents in your poverty why do you deprive them of this honor and yourselves of the privilege of being assisted and sustained by them come come to them with humble confidence so that they may look upon you with the eyes of parents and listen to your crying needs the arms of this lady are stretched out toward the poor and her hands opened for the needy and you ye rich of this world why will you confide so much in your uncertain riches at the imminent danger of losing your faith of piling up for yourselves heaviest cares and sorrows as mentioned by the apostle by your avarice you fail to conduct yourselves as children of god or of his mother by your actions you make of yourselves spurious offsprings for legitimate children confide in the care and love of their parents and abhor trusting in others who are not only strangers but enemies these truths are manifested to me by the divine light and charity compels me thus to speak the most high father not only provided nourishment for our pilgrims but also visible relief against the tediousness of this journey and continued solitude it happened a few times when the heavenly lady rested on the ground from her fatigue that as on other occasions a great multitude of birds came flying towards her from the mountains by the sweetness of their warbling and the variety of their plumage they sought to entertain and delight her perching on her shoulders and hands with signs of great joy the most prudent queen gently received them and invited them to acknowledge their creator by their songs and to be thankful for his having created them so beautiful and arrayed them in their gorgeous plumage given them the air and the earth for their enjoyment 
and provided them with daily food and sustenance. The birds responded to her exhortations with joyous movements and sweet warblings, while the loving mother joined them with still more sweet and melodious songs for the infant Jesus, extolling and blessing him, and acknowledging him as her God and her Son, and as the author of all these wonders. Also the holy angels took part in these colloquies, so full of sweetness, and alternated their offerings of praise with that of the great lady and of these simple birds. All this produced a harmony more perceptible by the spirit than by the senses, and of admirable concord for the rational soul. At other times, the heavenly princess conversed with the child and said, My love and light of my soul, how can I diminish thy labor? How can I relieve thee of thy hardships? What can I do to lighten the sufferings of this journey? O oh, would that I could carry thee, not in my arms, but in my bosom, and make for thee a soft couch in my heart, in order that thou mayest rest there without fatigue. And the sweet Jesus replied, My beloved mother, very easy do I rest in thy arms, while making this journey, reclining on thy breast. I am delighted by thy affection, and entertained by thy words. Sometimes the son and mother conversed with each other interiorly, and these conversations were so exalted and divine that our words cannot express them. St. Joseph shared in many of these mysteries and consolations, and thus he eased his journey, forgot his hardships, feeling within himself the delight and sweetness of such companionship. Yet he did not hear or perceive what the child said audibly to his mother, for at that time of the life of Jesus, this favor was reserved for her alone, as I have already remarked above. In this manner, our exiles proceeded on their way to Egypt. Instruction vouchsafed by the Most Holy Mary, Our Lady. My daughter, just as those who know the Lord also know how to trust in Him, so those who do not hope in His goodness and immense love have no perfect knowledge of the majesty of God. On account of the want of faith and hope, this love also is deficient, for we readily place our love in whom we have confidence and whom we esteem. In this error lies the source of all the damage done to mortals, for they have such a low conception of infinite bounty, which gave them being and which preserves them, that they fail to place full confidence in their God. Failing in this, they also fail in the love due to him, and they divert it toward the creatures. They esteem in them what they are seeking, namely, power, riches, vain honor, and ostentation. Although the faithful can remedy these injurious influences by faith and hope, yet they allow these virtues to remain dead and unused, and debase themselves to the level of worthless creatures. Those who have riches trust in them, and those who have none greedily haste after them. Some procure them by very reprehensible ways and means, some confide in influential persons, praising and flattering them. And thus it happens that very few seek the Lord in such a way as to deserve his providential care. Very few trust in God and acknowledge him as their father, who is willing to provide for his children, who will nourish and sustain them without fail in all necessities. This deceitful error has filled the earth with lovers of the world, has filled it with avarice and concupiscence against the law of the Creator, has made men insane in their desires, for all of them commonly strive after riches and earthly possessions, claiming thereby merely to satisfy their needs, which is only a pretext for hiding their want of interest in higher things. In reality, they lie to themselves abominously, since they are seeking the superfluous, not what is really necessary, but what ministers to worldly pride. If men would confide their desires to what is really necessary, it would be unreasonable to put any confidence in creatures instead of placing it in God alone, who ineffably provides even for the young ravens with no less solicitude than if their crowings were prayers sent up to their Creator for help. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 8 Secure in this confidence, I was not alarmed in my exile and prolonged journey. Since I trusted in the Lord, He provided for me in the time of my want. Thou also, my daughter, who art aware of this exalted providence, shouldest not afflict thyself in the time of need, nor neglect thy duties in order to make provision for them, nor confide in human efforts, nor in creatures. 
after having done what is required of thee the most efficacious means is to confide in the lord without being disturbed or confused hope patiently even when help is somewhat delayed it will always be at hand at a time when it will do most good and when the paternal love of the lord can manifest itself most conveniently and openly thus it happened with me and my spouse in the time of our destitution and necessity those that do not bear with adversity and do not put up with privations who turn toward dried up cisterns jeremiah chapter two verse five trusting in deceit and in the powerful of this world those that are not moderate in their desires and greedily covet what is unnecessary for the sustenance of life those that anxiously cling to what they possess fearing that they may be diminished and withholding the alms due to the poor all of them have reasons to dread lest divine providence showing itself just as niggardly in caring for them as they are in their confidence and in their charities to the poor deprive them of what they could otherwise easily expect to receive at its hands but the father in heaven who lets the sun rise over the just and the unjust matthew chapter five verse forty five and lets the rain fall on the good and the bad nevertheless helps all giving them life and nourishment however just as his blessings are distributed to the good and to the bad so also it cannot be a rule with god to give greater temporal goods to the good and less to the bad on the contrary he prefers that the chosen and predestined ones be poor letter of st james chapter two verse five both because they thus gain more merit and reward and because there are few who know how to use wealth properly and who can retain it without inordinate greed although my most holy son and i had nothing to fear from this danger yet he wished to furnish this example to men and to teach them this science through which eternal life comes to them end of chapter twenty three book two chapter twenty four of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter twenty four the holy travellers jesus mary and joseph arrive in egypt and after some wanderings they come to heliopolis where great miracles are wrought i have already mentioned that the flight of the incarnate word contained other mysteries and aimed at more exalted ends than to evade herod and his persecution the flight into egypt was to afford the infant savior an occasion of visiting that country and performing the miracles spoken of by the ancient prophets isaiah more expressly prophesies them when he says that the lord shall ascend upon a swift cloud and enter into egypt that the idols of egypt shall be moved at his presence and that the heart of the egyptians shall melt in the midst thereof isaiah chapter nineteen verse one these and other things contained in this prophecy happened at the time of the birth of christ our lord yet passing over what does not pertain to my purpose i wish to say that continuing their pilgrimage in the manner already described jesus mary and joseph arrived in the populated districts of egypt before they came to the place of their abode in heliopolis they were conducted by the angels according to the ordainment of the most high in a roundabout way so that they might pass through many places where god wished his miracles and blessings to be wrought for the good of the egyptians thus it came that they consumed in this journey more than fifty days and the distance of their journey from bethlehem or jerusalem amounted to more than two hundred leagues while by our direct route such long protracted travel would not have been necessary egypt was given to idolatry and its concomitant superstition even the small villages of this country were full of idols in many of these places temples had been built where the demons dwelt and the inhabitants instructed by these devils gathered in them to offer services and sacrifices in their honor while the demons answered their prayers by oracles thus obtaining full control of this foolish and superstitious nation steeped in these deceits they lived on in such error and subjection to the demons that only the strong arm of the lord which is the incarnate word could rescue these forsaken people and deliver them from the oppression of lucifer 
it was a harder and more dangerous slavery than that in which the egyptians had held the people of israel exodus chapter 1 verse 11 in order to obtain this deliverance and enlighten those that were living in the region and the shadows of death luke chapter 1 verse 79 and in order that they might see the great light spoken of by isaiah isaiah chapter 9 verse 2 the most high ordained that the son of justice christ malachi chapter 4 verse 2 shortly after his birth should appear in egypt in the arms of his most fortunate mother and that he should journey and pass through this country illumining it everywhere by the power of his divine light so then the infant jesus with his mother and saint joseph reached the inhabited country of egypt on entering the towns the divine infant in the arms of his mother raised his eyes and his hands to the father asking for the salvation of these inhabitants held captive by satan and immediately he made use of his sovereign and divine power and drove the demons from the idols and hurled them into the infernal abyss like lightning flashed from the clouds they darted forth and descended into the lowermost caverns of hell and darkness luke chapter 10 verse 4 at the same instant the idols crashed to the ground the altars fell to pieces and the temples crumbled to ruins the cause of these marvelous effects were known to the heavenly lady for she united her prayers with those of her most holy son as cooperatrix of his salvation saint joseph also knew this to be the work of the incarnate word and he praised and extolled him in holy admiration but the demons although they felt the divine power knew not whence this power proceeded the egyptian people were astounded at these inexplicable happenings although among the more learned ever since the sojourn of jeremias in egypt an ancient tradition was current that a king of the jews would come and that the temples of the idols would be destroyed yet of this prophecy the common people had no knowledge nor did the learned know how it was to be fulfilled and therefore the terror and confusion was spread among all of them as was prophesied by isaiah isaiah chapter nine verse one in this disturbance and fear some reflecting on these events came to our great lady and saint joseph and in their curiosity at seeing these strangers in their midst they also spoke to them about the ruin of their temples and their idols making use of this occasion the mother of wisdom began to undeceive these people speaking to them of the true god and teaching them that he is the one and only creator of heaven and earth who is alone to be adored and acknowledged as god that all others are but false and deceitful gods nothing more than the wood or clay or metal of which they are made having neither eyes nor ears nor any power that the same artisans that made them and any other man could destroy them at pleasure since any man is more noble and powerful than they that the oracles which they gave forth were answers of the lying and deceitful demons within them and that the latter had no power since there is but one true god the heavenly lady was so sweet and kind in her words and at the same time so full of life and force her appearance was so charming and all her intercourse was accompanied by such salutary effects that the rumor of the arrival of these strange pilgrims quickly spread about in the different towns and many people gathered to see and hear them moreover the powerful prayers of the incarnate word wrought a change of hearts and the crumbling of the idols caused an incredible commotion among these people instilling into their minds knowledge of the true god and sorrow for their sins without their knowing whence or through whom these blessings came to them jesus mary and joseph pursued their way through many towns of egypt performing these and many other miracles driving out the demons not only from the idols but out of many bodies possessed by them curing many that were grievously and dangerously ill enlightening the hearts by the doctrines of truth and eternal life by these temporal benefits and others so effectual in moving the ignorant earthly-minded people many were drawn to listen to the instructions of mary and joseph concerning a good and salutary life they arrived at heliopolis which lies in the direction of Thebaid, and is called by some the city of mercury in it there were many idols infested by powerful demons one of them dwelt in a tree at the entrance of the city for the neighboring inhabitants had begun to venerate this tree on account of its size and beauty 
whence the demon had taken occasion to erect his seat in it. When the incarnate word came within the sight of this tree, not only was the demon hurled from his seat and cast into hell, but the tree bowed down to the ground, as if rejoiced by its good fortune. For even the senseless creatures testified how tyrannical is the dominion of the devil. This miraculous reverence of the trees happened at other times during this journey of Christ, although these incidents are not all recorded. But the memory of this event remained for centuries, for the leaves and fruits of this tree cured many sicknesses. Of this miracle, some authors make mention, as well as of others in other cities visited by the incarnate word and his mother. There is to this day a traditional fountain near Cairo, from which the heavenly lady drew water for herself and the child, and for washing his clothes. All this rests on truth, and the veneration for these wonders and these places still lives, not only among the faithful who visit the holy places, but also among the infidels, who there occasionally obtain temporal benefits from the hands of the Lord. For also the infidels sometimes obtain certain favors, in order that the Lord may be justified before them, or in order that the memory of his wonders may be preserved. But it is not necessary to speak of them, especially just now, since the principal wonders during the stay of our Lord in Egypt were wrought in Heliopolis, which not without mysterious import was called City of the Sun, and is now called Cairo the Grand. In writing of these wonders, I asked the great queen in astonishment how she could have traveled with the child through so many strange providences and cities, for it appeared to me that she thereby prolonged exceedingly the labors and hardships of their journey, and Our Lady replied, Do not wonder that my most holy son and I journeyed so far in order to gain souls, for the sake of even one soul, if possible, and if there would be no other way, we would willingly traverse the whole world. If what Jesus and Mary did for the salvation of us men does seem great to us, it is because we do not understand the immensity of their love, and because we understand just as little how to make a proper return for such love. On account of these strange happenings, when so many of the demons were driven by a new and unwanted power to populate hell, Lucifer was highly disturbed. Furiously enraged, he issued forth into the world in order to investigate the cause of such unlooked-for events. He roamed about through all Egypt, where so many temples and altars of his idols had been overthrown, and reaching Heliopolis, the largest of the cities and the scene of the greatest destruction in his dominions, he sought to ascertain with the utmost anxiety what kind of people dwelt therein. He found nothing new, except that Most Holy Mary had arrived in the city. Of the infant Jesus he made no account, deeming him a child just like all the rest of that age, for he knew nothing particular about him. But as he had been so often vanquished by the virtues and holiness of the Virgin Mother, he was seized with a new consternation. Although he considered a woman far too insignificant for such great works, yet he resolved anew to persecute her and to stir up against her his associates in wickedness. He therefore returned immediately to hell, and calling a meeting of the princes of darkness, told them of the destruction of the temples and idols in Egypt. For these demons had been hurled by the divine power from their habitations with such suddenness, confusion, and torment, that at their departure they were unable to ascertain the fate of the idols and temples which they were forced to leave. Lucifer, informing them of all that had happened, and that he feared the destruction of his reign in Egypt, told them that he could not ascertain or understand what was the cause of this ruin, since he had found there only that woman, his enemy, for so the dragon called Most Holy Mary. And though he knew that her power was extraordinary, yet he did not presume it to be so great as to account for such portents. Nevertheless, he wished them to begin a new war against her, and that all should prepare themselves for it. The satellites of Lucifer proclaimed their readiness to obey, trying to console him in his desperate fury, and promising him victory, as if their forces were as great as their arrogance. Isaiah chapter 16 verse 6 Many legions of devils accordingly sallied forth from hell, and betook themselves to the place where the Queen of Heaven was at that time, as they suspected that God had used the Most Holy Mary as his instrument in causing all their losses in that unfortunate country, they thought they could make up for their defeat and restore their dominion if they succeeded in overcoming her. 
but they were astonished to find that when they attempted to approach her in order to begin their diabolical temptations they could not come nearer to her than a distance of two thousand paces for they were restrained by the divine power which they perceived issuing forth from the heavenly lady herself although lucifer and the hostile bands struggled violently they were paralyzed and as if bound in strong and tormenting shackles without being able to reach the most unconquerable queen while she witnessed their struggles holding in her arms the omnipotence of god himself as lucifer persevered in his attempts he was suddenly hurled into the abyss of hell with all his squadrons and wicked spirits this defeat and ruin filled the dragon with vast torment and anxiety and as the like had overtaken him repeatedly since the incarnation he began to have new misgivings whether the messiah had not come into the world but since he knew nothing of the mystery and expected the messiahs to come in great splendor and renown he remained in uncertainty and doubt full of tormenting fury and wrath he was consumed with the desire to find out the cause of his sufferings and the more he inquired the more he was involved in darkness and so much the less did he ascertain of the true cause instruction given me by the queen of heaven most holy mary my daughter great and above all else to be esteemed is the consolation of the faithful friends of my most holy son when they with lively faith and assurance are permitted to serve the lord of lords and the god of gods who alone holds power and dominion over all creation and who triumphs and reigns over his enemies in this feeling of assurance the intellect is delighted the memory is recreated the will is rejoiced and all the powers of the devout soul enjoy the sweetness of the most exalted activity for they are entirely taken up with this supreme goodness holiness and infinite power which has need of none outside of itself and whose will governs all created things second book of maccabees chapter fourteen verse thirty five apocalypse chapter four verse eleven oh how many thousandfold blessings do those creatures lose who forgetful of their true happiness employ all the time of their life and all their powers in attending upon visible things pursuing the momentary pleasures and seeking the apparent and deceitful goods of this world in the knowledge and light vouchsafed to thee i would wish my daughter that thou withdraw thyself from this danger and that thy intellect and memory occupy themselves continually with the reality of the existence of thy god in this endless sea engulf and annihilate thyself repeating without cessation who is like to god our lord that dwells on high and looks upon the humble in heaven and on earth psalm one hundred twelve verse five who is like to him that is almighty and depends upon no one that humbles the proud and casts down those whom the blind world calls powerful that triumphs over the demon and hurls him into the abyss in order that thy heart may dilate so much the more upon these truths and attain a greater power over the enemies of the most high and of thyself i wish that as far as is possible thou imitate me glorying in the victories and triumphs of his mighty arm and seeking thyself to have a share in those which he gains over this cruel dragon no created tongue not that of the seraphim can describe what my soul felt when i beheld my most holy son working such wonders against his enemies for the benefit of the souls blinded and terrorized by their errors and for the exaltation and honor of the most high in this jubilation i magnify the lord and in company with my son i compose new hymns of praise as his mother and as spouse of the holy ghost thou art a daughter of the holy church and a spouse of my most blessed son favored by his grace therefore it is just that thou be zealous in acquiring this glory and honor for him striving against his enemies and battling for the triumphs of thy spouse end of chapter twenty four book two chapter twenty five of the mystical city of god volume two by the venerable sister mary of jesus of agreda this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter twenty five in accordance with the divine will jesus mary and joseph settle down to dwell near the city of heliopolis and they regulate their daily life during their banishment 
the traditions which in many parts of egypt kept alive the remembrance of wonders wrought by the incarnate word gave rise to differences of opinion among the sacred and other writers in regard to the city in which our exiles lived during their stay in egypt some of them assert that they dwelt in this city some in another but all of them may be right and in accordance with facts since each one may be speaking of a different period of the sojourn of our pilgrims in memphis or babylon of egypt or in Matarie, for they visited not only these cities but many others i for my part have been informed that they passed through these and then reached heliopolis where they took up their abode their holy guardian angels instructed the heavenly queen and saint joseph that they were to settle in this city for besides the ruin of the temples and idols which just as in other places took place at their arrival here the lord had resolved to perform still other miracles for his glory and for the rescue of souls and the inhabitants of this city according to the good fortune already prognosticated in its name as city of the sun were to see the sun of justice and grace arise over them and shine upon them following these orders saint joseph sought to purchase for a suitable price some dwelling in the neighborhood and the lord ordained that he should find a poor and humble yet serviceable house at small distance from the city just such as the queen of heaven desired having therefore found this dwelling near heliopolis they took their abode therein at the first entrance of the heavenly lady with her divine son and saint joseph she prostrated herself to the ground kissing it in profound humility and lovingly thanking the most high for having secured them this place of rest after their prolonged and laborious journeyings she thanked also the earth and the elements for bearing with her since in her matchless humility she persisted in esteeming herself unworthy of all favors she adored the immutable being of god in this prostration dedicating all that she was to do in this place to his honor and worship interiorly she made a sacrifice of all her powers and faculties offering to assume readily and with joy all the labors by which the almighty could be served during her exile for in her prudence she foresaw and affectionately embraced them all by means of her divine knowledge she set a great value on sufferings understanding how highly they are esteemed at the divine tribunal and how her most holy son looked upon them as a rich treasure and inheritance having performed these exalted acts of devotion she set about humbly to clean and arrange the poor little house borrowing the instruments for this purpose although our heavenly strangers were thus sufficiently provided with the shelter of bare walls they were in want of all else pertaining to the sustenance and comfort of daily life as they now lived in an inhabited country the miraculous assistance which they had enjoyed in the desert through the ministry of the angels failed them and the lord left them to the last resource of the poor namely the begging of alms having come to these straits of suffering hunger saint joseph went forth to seek this kind of assistance for the love of god giving thereby an example to the poor not to complain of their affliction and all other means failing not to be ashamed to have recourse to this expedient for so early the lord of all creation allowed himself to fall into this extreme of being obliged to beg for his sustenance in order that he might have an occasion to return the alms a hundredfold during the first three days of their arrival in heliopolis just as in other places of egypt the queen had for herself and for her only begotten no other sustenance than what was begged by his foster father saint joseph when he began to earn some wages by his work he made a humble couch for the mother and a cradle for her son while he himself had as a resting place only the bare ground for the house was without any furniture until by his own labor he succeeded in making some of the most indispensable pieces for the convenience of all three in this connection i must not pass over in silence the fact that in their extreme poverty and need most holy mary and joseph regretted not their house in nazareth nor thought of the aid of their relations and friends nor of the gifts of the kings which they had given away and which if they had saved them would now be useful all of these regrets were far from their minds nor did they complain of the great privation and destitution thinking of the past or worrying about their future 
but they bore all with incomparable equanimity joy and tranquillity resigning themselves to the divine providence in their extreme need and poverty o oh, smallness of our unfaithful hearts in what excruciating anxieties we are apt to be cast at finding ourselves threatened with poverty or privation immediately we begin to rail at occasions lost or having missed or neglected this or that advantage or at not having done this or that by which we would have evaded our misfortunes all these complaints are vain and most foolish since they can bring no relief although it would have been good if we had not committed the sins by which we are thus punished yet very often we are sorry for them only on account of the temporal disadvantages and not for the guilt connected with sin slow and stupid of heart are we to perceive the spiritual things conducive to our justification and growth in grace luke chapter twenty four verse twenty five while on the other hand we are full of fleshly and earthly rashness in entering upon temporal affairs and anxieties the example of our exiles is indeed a severe reprimand for our low-minded earthliness the most prudent lady and her spouse forsaken and destitute of all temporal help accommodated themselves joyfully to the poverty of their little dwelling of the three rooms which it contained they assigned one to be the sanctuary or temple of the infant jesus under the tender care of the most pure mother there they placed the cradle and her bare couch until after some days by the labor of the holy spouse and through the kindness of some pious women they could obtain wherewith to cover it another room was set aside for the sleeping place and oratory of saint joseph the third served as a workshop for plying his trade in view of their great poverty and the great difficulty of sufficient employment as a carpenter the great lady resolved to assist him by the work of her hands to earn a livelihood she immediately executed her resolve by seeking to obtain needlework through the intervention of the pious women who attracted by her modesty and sweetness were beginning to have intercourse with her as all that she attended to or busied herself with was so perfect the reputation of her skill soon spread about so that she never was in want of employment whereby to eke out the slender means of livelihood for her son the true god and man in order to obtain the indispensable victuals and clothing furnish the house ever so moderately and pay the necessary expenses it seemed to our queen that she must employ all day in work and consume the night in attending to her spiritual exercises this she resolved upon not for any motives of gain or because she did not continue in her contemplations during the day for this was her incessant occupation in the presence of the infant god as i have so often said and shall repeat hereafter but some of the hours which she was wont to spend in special exercises she wished to transfer to the night-time in order to be able to extend the hours of manual labor not being minded to ask or expect god's miraculous assistance for anything which she could attain by greater diligence and additional labor on her own part in all such cases we ask for miraculous help more for our own convenience than on account of necessity the most prudent queen asked the eternal father to provide sustenance for her divine son but at the same time she continued to labor like one who does not trust in herself or in her own efforts she united prayer with her labors in order to obtain the necessities of life like other men the infant jesus was much pleased with the prudence of his mother and with resignation in the midst of her dire poverty and in return for her fidelity he asked to lessen the labors she had undertaken one day he spoke to her from the cradle and said my mother i wish to set up a rule for thy daily life and labors immediately the heavenly mother knelt before him and answered my sweetest love and lord of all my being i praise and magnify thee because thou hast condescended to meet my secret thoughts and desires may it please thee to direct my footsteps according to thy holy will to regulate all my labors according to thy wishes and to order all my occupations in each hour of the day according to thy divine pleasure and since thy deity became incarnate and thy majesty condescended to take heed of my longings speak light of my eyes for thy servant hears the lord replied my dearest mother from the time of nightfall that is to say from the hour called by us nine o'clock thou shalt take some sleep and rest 
and from midnight until the break of day thou mayest occupy thyself in contemplation with me and we will praise the eternal father thereupon prepare the necessary food for thyself and joseph and afterwards give me nourishment and hold me in thy arms until the third hour when thou shalt place me in the arms of thy husband in order to afford him some refreshment in his labors then retire until it is time to prepare his meal and return to thy work since thou hast not with thee the sacred scriptures which were wont to console thee thou canst by thy holy science enter into the doctrines of eternal life in order that thou mayest follow me in perfect imitation and continually pray to the eternal father for the sinners by this rule of life the most holy mary governed her doings during her stay in egypt every day three times she nursed the infant god at her breast for when he pointed out to her the hour in which she was to nurse him in the morning he did not forbid her to afford him nourishment at other times as she had been accustomed to do since his nativity whenever the heavenly mother was engaged in any work she always performed it in his presence and upon her knees and it was very usual during their colloquies and conferences that the king from his cradle and the mother at her work broke out in mysterious canticles of praise if they were all written they would outnumber all the psalms and the hymns used by the church and all that are written for there can be no doubt that god conversed with the source of his humanity his most blessed mother in a more exalted and wonderful manner than with david moses mary anne and all the prophets by these hymns the heavenly mother was continually filled with new influences of the divinity and new longings to be united to his unchangeable being for she alone was the phoenix which could be renewed in this conflagration and the royal eagle which could penetrate into the ineffable light and soar from heights to heights whither no other created being could venture to wing its flight she fulfilled the end for which the divine word had assumed flesh in her virginal womb namely to draw on and elevate the rational creatures to the divinity as she was the only creature which did not present the hindrance of sin and its effects nor from disordered passions and appetites but was free of the downward tendency of our earthly nature she flew upward to her beloved and to his exalted habitation not resting until she reached her centre which was the divinity moreover she had always in view the way and the light john chapter sixteen verse six the incarnate word and all her desires and affections met in the immutable being of the most high and therefore she hastened on in burning fervor embracing her goal rather than flying towards it and living more in her love than in her life sometimes also the infant god slept under the watchful care of his happy and fortunate mother in order that also this saying might become true i sleep but my heart is awake canticles chapter five verse two and as this most holy body of her son was for her a most clear mirror in which she saw and penetrated the secrets of his deified soul and its operations wisdom chapter seven verse sixteen she beheld herself therein again and again especially consoling to the heavenly lady was it to see the most holy soul of her son revealed to her in all its heroic operations as a pilgrim and yet a comprehensor while at the same time his bodily faculties were lost in the tranquil and beauteous sleep of childhood his whole humanity being hypostatically united to the divinity our language is incapable of describing the sweet affections and flights of love and the heroic acts of the queen of heaven on these occasions and falls short of the reality but where words fail let faith and love supply the deficiency whenever she wished to afford saint joseph the consolation of holding the infant jesus the mother of god said my son and lord look upon thy faithful servant joseph with the love of a son and father and delight thyself in the purity of his affectionate soul so acceptable in thy eyes and to saint joseph she said my spouse receive in thy arms the lord who holds in his hands all the orbs of heaven and earth and who has given them existence out of his mere bounty refresh thyself from thy labors in him who is the glory of all creation for these favors saint joseph returned most humble thanks and he was wont to ask his spouse whether he could dare to caress the child 
encouraged by her he would do so and this privilege made him forget all the hardships of his labor and made them easy and sweet in his eyes whenever mary and joseph were at their meals they had with them the infant in serving the meals the heavenly queen held him in her arms partaking of the food with great modesty and in holding him she at the same time afforded her most pure soul a sweeter and more nourishing food than to the body adoring and loving him as the eternal god and caressing him with the tenderness of a mother it is impossible to conceive the attention which she paid to this double duty on the one hand to fulfil all obligation that was due to him as from a creature to its creator looking upon him in his divinity as son of the eternal father as king of kings and lord of lords as the maker and preserver of all the universe and on the other hand to give to him all the attention that he deserved as an infant serving and nursing him betwixt these two extremes she was entirely inflamed with love and her whole being consumed in heroic acts of admiration praise and affection of all the rest which the two spouses did it can only be said that they were the wonder of the angels and that they attained the summit of holiness and of divine pleasure instruction vouchsafed by the queen of heaven most holy mary my daughter i came into egypt where i knew no relations or friends in a land of foreign religion where i could afford no home or protection or assistance to my son whom i loved so much it can easily be understood then what tribulations and hardships we suffered since the lord permitted them to come over us thou canst not understand with what patience and forbearance we accepted them and even the angels cannot estimate the reward i merited from the most high by the love and resignation with which i bore them and which were greater than if i had been in the greatest prosperity it is true i grieved much to see my husband in such necessity and want but at the same time i blessed the lord to be able to suffer them in this most noble patience and joy of spirit i wish that thou imitate me whenever the lord offers thee an occasion and that thou learn to act with prudence interiorly and exteriorly ordering well thy actions and thy thoughts without hindrance to either of them when the necessities of life are wanting to those under thy charge exert thyself properly to obtain them if sometimes thou must sacrifice thy own tranquillity in fulfilling this obligation thou needst not on that account lose thy peace of mind especially if thou art mindful of what i have so often told thee not to lose sight of the presence of the lord for by his divine light and grace if thou art careful and preservest thy peace thou canst do all things whatever can duly be procured by human exertion is not to be expected by a miracle nor must one exempt himself from labor in the hope of a supernatural interference on the part of god for the lord sweetly concurs with the ordinary and natural course of created things the labor of the body is serviceable to the soul as a sacrifice and as an increase of merits due to that kind of activity while at work the rational creature can praise god and adore him in spirit and in truth john chapter four verse twenty three in order to fulfill this duty direct thy activity according to his pleasure consult his will in regard to them weighing them with the scales of the sanctuary and riveting thy attention upon the divine light which the almighty infuses in thy soul end of chapter twenty five Book two, chapter twenty six of the Mystical City of God, Volume two, by the Venerable Sister Mary of Jesus of Agreda. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book two, chapter twenty six of the wonders which the infant Jesus, most holy Mary and Joseph, wrought at Heliopolis in Egypt. Isaiah says that the lord shall enter egypt upon a light cloud in order to work miracles in that country isaiah in calling the most holy mary or as others think the humanity derived from her a cloud no doubt wishes to indicate that the lord was to fertilize and water the barren land of the hearts of its inhabitants in order that henceforth they might produce the fruits of sanctity and of divine knowledge and so it really happened after that heavenly cloud had overshadowed this land 
for immediately the belief in the true god began to spread and idolatry to be destroyed the paths of eternal life began to be opened which until then had been held closed by the demons to such an extent was all this true that there was scarcely any province in that land in which the true god remained unknown as soon as the incarnate word had arrived therein although some of the people came to this knowledge through intercourse with the hebrews which existed between these two nations at that time fourth book of kings chapter seventeen verse twenty four yet a great many errors superstitions and worship of the demons were mixed up with it just as was the case with the babylonians who at another time came to live in samaria but after the sun of justice began to illumine egypt and mary most holy the taintless cloud began to overshadow that land it became so fertile in holiness and grace that it gave forth abundant fruit for many centuries this is witnessed by the many saints that lived in it afterwards and by the thousands of hermits that made its mountains gather up and distill such sweet honey of sanctity and christian perfection as i said in order to secure these blessings to the egyptians the lord took his dwelling in the city of heliopolis as it was so full of idols temples and altars of the demons which at his entrance all fell to the dust with great crashing noise the whole city was set in commotion and confusion by the suddenness of this ruin isaiah chapter nineteen verse one people rushed about astonished and as if crazed in mind curiosity brought to the newly arrived strangers numbers of men and women who sought to speak to the great queen and saint joseph the heavenly mother who was aware of the mysterious designs of god spoke to their inmost hearts with great wisdom prudence and sweetness they were filled with wonder at her incomparable gentleness and her exalted teachings which undeceived them of their errors and as she immediately cured some of their sick she quieted and encouraged them so much the sooner these miracles were so rapidly noised abroad that in a short time an immense concourse of people gathered to see the heavenly strangers and the most prudent lady was forced to consult her most holy son as to her further conduct toward this great multitude the infant god told her to instruct them in the knowledge of god teach them his true worship and exhort them to desist from sinful life in this office of preaching to the egyptians and of teaching them our heavenly princess served as the instrument of her most holy son who lent power to her words the effect of it was so great that many books would be required to describe the wonders and the conversions of souls that took place during the seven years of their stay in this province for in her ministry she was filled with the benedictions of sweetness psalm twenty verse four whenever the heavenly lady listened to and answered those that came to her she held in her arms the infant jesus as the one who was the author of all the graces to be dispensed to sinners she spoke to each one in the manner suitable to his capacity and serviceable for teaching him the doctrine of eternal life she enlightened them concerning the divinity and made them understand that there cannot be more than one god she explained to them the several articles of truth pertaining to the creation and redemption of the world she impressed upon their minds the commandments of the decalogue founded upon the natural law and she showed them the manner of adoring and worshipping god and how they were to expect the regeneration of the human race concerning the demons she explained how they were enemies of god and men how deeply they kept men in error by their idol worship and the false answers of their oracles how they induced men to commit the vilest abominations and afterwards secretly tempted them by exciting the disorderly passions although the queen of heaven was so pure and free from all that is imperfect nevertheless for the glory of the most high she did not deem it beneath her to speak to them of those vile and impure excesses in which all egypt was sunk she also declared to them that the repairer of so many ills who was to overcome the demons as it was written of him was already come into the world although she did not say that she held him in her arms in order that her teachings might be accepted so much the more readily and the truth might be more apparent she confirmed her words by great miracles curing all sorts of people who were sick or possessed by the devil and who came from all parts of the country a few times the queen went to the infirmaries and conferred admirable blessings upon the sick 
everywhere she consoled the sorrowful and brought relief to the afflicted and the unfortunate winning all by loving kindness and beneficence and admonishing them with sweet earnestness in regard to the cure of the sick and wounded the heavenly lady hesitated between two different sentiments the one of charity which drew her to nurse the wounded with her own hand and the other of modesty which forbade her to touch any one in order that all propriety might be observed her most holy son empowered her to cure the men by her mere word and exhortations while she might cure the women by the touch of her hands and cleansing of their wounds this course of action she maintained thenceforward taking upon herself as well the office of a mother as a sick nurse respectively but as i will narrate after they had lived two years in that place st joseph also began to cure the sick while the matchless charity of the queen busied itself more particularly with the cure of the women though she was herself endowed with such unsullied purity free from all infirmities and sufferings yet she hesitated not to tend their festering ulcers and apply with her own hands the coverings and bandages required all this she did with such tender compassion as if she herself were afflicted with their misfortunes sometimes it happened that in order to relieve and cure the poor she asked permission of her divine son to place him in the cradle thus permitting the lord of the poor to witness in another way the loving charity of this humble lady but in all these occupations and cures oh wonderful to relate this most modest mistress never looked upon the face of either man or woman even when the wound was in the face her modesty was so exquisite that she would not have been able to recognize any of her patients by their features if she had not known all men by another interior kind of vision on account of the excessive heat prevailing in egypt and on account of many disorders rampant among the people the distempers of the egyptians were widespread and grievous during the years of the stay of the infant jesus and his most holy mother pestilence devastated heliopolis and other places on this account and on account of the report of their wonderful deeds multitudes of people came to them from all parts of the country and returned home cured in body and soul in order that the grace of the lord might flow more abundantly and in order that his kindest mother might have assistance in her works of mercy god at the instance of the heavenly mistress ordained saint joseph as her helper in the teaching and healing of the infirm for this purpose he was endowed with new light and power of healing the holy mary began to make use of his assistance in the third year of their stay in egypt so that now he ordinarily taught and cured the men while the blessed lady attended to the women incredible was the fruit resulting from their labors in the souls of men for her uninterrupted beneficence and the gracious efficacy of her words drew all toward our queen and her modesty and holiness filled them with devoted love they offered her many presents and large possessions anxious to see her make use of them but never did she receive anything for herself or reserve it for her own use for they continued to provide for their wants by the labor of her hands and the earnings of saint joseph when at times the blessed lady was offered some gift that seemed serviceable and proper for helping the needy and the poor she would accept it for that purpose only with this understanding would she ever yield to the pious and affectionate importunities of devout persons and even then she often made them a present in return of things made by her own hands from what i have related we can form some idea how great and how numerous were the miracles wrought by the holy family during their seven years stay in egypt and heliopolis for it would be impossible to enumerate and describe them all instruction vouchsafed to me by the queen of heaven most holy mary my daughter thou art full of wonder at the works of mercy which i exercised in egypt curing the sick of their infirmities and helping the poor in their necessities in order to relieve them in body and soul thou wilt be able to understand how all these comported with my love of modesty and retirement when thou takest into consideration the immense love that urged my most holy son to hasten immediately after his birth to the assistance of these people and pour out over them his immense love in his longings for their salvation this love he communicated to me and thus made me an instrument of his power or i should not have dared to enter upon such a great enterprise 
for though i always preferred to abstain from speaking or communicating with others yet the will of my son and lord govern me in all things of thee my friend i desire that in imitation of me thou work for the benefit and salvation of thy neighbours seeking to follow me in perfection and quality of my works thou needst not seek occasions for the lord will send them in some extraordinary circumstances however thou mayest find it advisable to offer thy services but seek to exert thy influence upon all teach and exhort them according to thy light not presuming to take upon thyself the office of a teacher but of one that seeks to console and one that pities the hardships of her brothers as one who with much reserve and humility and with great charity seeks to exhort them to patience as for those under thy charge exhort and reprove them govern and direct them to greater and greater perfection of virtue and to fulfil the divine pleasure for next to seeking thy own perfection god wills that thou encourage and teach those under thy charge according to power and graces given to thee pray without ceasing for those to whom thou canst not speak thus extending thy charity towards all men since thou canst not go outside to tend the sick make up for it by taking care of those living with thee zealously serving them personally in whatever pertains to their comfort and wants do not consider thyself above this service because thou art their superioress for on this very account thou must act as their mother and show thy loving care as such toward all while in other things thou must interiorly esteem thyself below them since the world ordinarily leaves the care of the sick to the most poor and despised simply because it does not know the high value of this service therefore i too assign to thee as to one who is poor and the least of all this office of tending the sick in order that thou mayest follow me in the performance of it End of chapter twenty six